You like that one? Yeah. I got plenty more. You like uh, country anthems for the working class. I got plenty of those. Let me just riff a couple. I'm a hardworking man living a hardworking life. I got my hardworking kids and my hardworking wife. I'd like to take it easy, but I know why I can't budge until we get all those fat guys to lay off the fudge. If you eat fudge once, then you're a traitor in my eyes. Do I have any that aren't about fat people? None of my songs are about fat people. I, I don't know where, even where you get... Okay, well, here's another one. Here's another one. Lord, we got so many workers Trying to get by, Lord, trying to get by Well, my boss would probably love to give me a raise But those fat people hate that's the problem i'm not pro fat i'm not pro skinny people always try to put you in a box like what body type are you you know in favor of and i, I just don't really have one well, i just can't believe that the world has gone to sleep the ones who play for keeps and they may be softly weak they got us under their control to them we are merely sheeple you know who I'm talking about, it's overweight people. I think they rule the world, they rule us all. Alright, for this next song, if you're working class, you better make sure there's nothing above your head, because you're about to get uplifted. Here we go. Well, I work such long hours and I never get the right pay. My rent's due and my bill's piled up, I wish I knew the way. Well, my back's broke and my arm's tired and I barely know my own name. When I drop dead of the black lung, sure you'll know just who to blame. It's those fat guys eating chips and through those chips they control the global economy. Well, that's just an expression. You've heard that before. Most people don't need the lyrics broken down for them, but actually, you know, I'm saying that I like them. Workers of the world, rise up and unite With a combined strength, now we can win the fight If you work together, well I don't see why We can't defeat our enemy, people of a certain BMI Hey, if you're five foot three, well that's a bad start But I also need to get your weight so I can calculate the next part no, the song is not just about fat people. It's way bigger than fat people, which is, must be huge. I'm fat phobic, really fat phobic. I'm so fat phobic that I... Ah, you know what? I heard it that time. That time I did hear it. Should I... Who... Why do I keep doing that? Is this, uh... Is it fat people's fault by any chance? No. Now I see that my brain went there. That might be a problem. August 23rd, 2023, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. This was the date and location of the first debate of the 2023 Republican primary, where candidates from across the GOP spectrum came together to square off in a brutal Thunderdome deathmatch of cold, hard facts, logic, and absolutely no spin allowed to find out who stood the best chance of being the first place loser when Trump inevitably knocked them all out, possibly from prison. As we sit here tonight, the number one song on the Billboard chart is called Rich Men North of Richmond. It is by a singer from Farmville, Virginia, named Oliver Anthony. His lyrics speak of alienation, of deep frustration, with the state of government and of this country. Washington, D.C. is about 100 miles north of Richmond. So, Governor DeSantis, why is this song striking such a nerve in this country right now? What do you think it means? It was truly a surreal moment to explain why. Let's rewind back a couple of weeks to when Oliver Anthony was a completely unknown country musician who had a recording of one of his songs posted to the Radio West Virginia YouTube account. The song blew up online in 
a kind of unprecedented way. Instead of the usual path songs take to go mega viral from people who are actually into music, rich men north of Richmond achieved success by being posted and reposted by politicians and pundits. First, it was conservatives like Pizzagate OG Jack Posobiec and self-identified theocratic fascist Matt Walsh. Then, the people on the left saw those posts, listened to the song, and started posting about it equally as much, for very different reasons. Everyone was posting about it in one way or another. It was kind of like the Barbie movie, but the teams were reversed, if that makes sense. Now, this was the environment where I first came across the song. Hey there, I'm Jill Goblin, and I'm making myself part of the story now. A little bit about me, I'm a Libra, uh, favorite color orange, television show I was obsessed with as a child, Power Rangers, Mighty Morphin, more of a Zed fan than a Repulsa. Politically, I'm a leftist, and my least leftist opinion is probably that country music is unironically good. It seems like every couple of weeks there's a new country song that my leftist comrades on Twitter lose their shit over. And sometimes I agree with them, sometimes not. Try that in a small town, genuinely bad song. Luke Combs' version of Fast Car? Uh, sorry, it's a beautiful cover of a beautiful song. What do you want from me? I want him to do talking about a revolution next. But when Richmond North of Richmond became a discourse, just from seeing the people who were promoting it the most, I assumed this had to be some kind of bluegrass mind kampf. I said to myself, you know what? Yeah. I'm in the mood to really piss myself off today. Hopefully make a post or two about this trending topic and get some of that engagement serotonin that I love so very, very much. So I checked out the video, and to my surprise, I mostly thought the song was really, really awesome. Okay, this ginger's got soul, I said to myself. Maybe slightly biased because I feel like I was sort of destined to play Oliver Anthony on SNL. Oh, hang on, I'm getting a call. Oh, Lauren Michaels. Okay, I'll call I feel seen, you know, multi-hair color representation. We don't get it a lot. Blonde, redhead, brunette. We're like human Neapolitan ice cream. People don't know what to think about us chingers, you know? We're like red-haired time bombs who didn't get beat up for it as kids because until puberty, we walked undetected amongst the masses. I'd call us daywalkers, but we're still too pale to walk outside during the day. Anytime we want, we can shave and switch it up. Ginger fluid is a thing. <laughs> All right, that's enough of that. We like to have fun around here. Let me cut to the chase. Turns out, I did think the song was actually really awesome and catchy, except for a couple lines that I gotta admit were really, really bad, but still catchy. Lua, let me start with what I liked. I described the song as a kind of Appalachian folk-tinged country anthem of an alienated working class. I'm not sure I used all of those words correctly, but Oliver starts off singing about working a shitty job for low pay. Uh, I've been selling my soul, working all day. Overtime hours for BS pay. So I can sit out here and waste my life away. Drag back home, drown my troubles away. Yes, queen, it's true. Working all day for trash money completely sucks. It makes life unbearable, and it only benefits those at the top, who absolutely do not work as hard. So far, I love it. Later, the song gets more specific as to who is to blame for this bullshit life that all of us in the category of humans who must work to survive are forced into. These rich men north of Richmond. Lord knows they all want to have total control, want to know what you think, want to know what you do. And they don't think you know, but I know that you do. At first, I wasn't sure what North of Richmond meant, but I looked on the Oliver Anthony Music YouTube page where he posted an earlier version of the song a few weeks before getting it professionally recorded. Just to be clear, Richmond, North of Richmond refers to Washington, D.C. politicians. Now, this is in no way a knock against people from up north. That makes sense. As they mentioned in the debate, Oliver Anthony is from Virginia, and Richmond, Virginia is the city directly south of Washington on the I-95. People have asked, why call Washington north of Richmond? Is that supposed to be a reference to the Mason-Dixon line, which is also north of Richmond, Virginia? Is this a pro-slavery, neo-Confederate song? Why use that phrase specifically? Now, I guess I understand why people might ask that question, but the answer seems pretty obvious to me. It's because Richmond north of Richmond sounds nice. It's a song. So, it sounds nice when it sounds nice. Try it out! Richmond north of Richmond, Richmond north of Richmond, Richmond in Washington. It's not as nice, right? Another line I saw a few leftists angrily pointing out was this one. I wish politicians would look out for miners. And not just miners on an island somewhere. Now, a lot of people have been saying that merely mentioning miners on an island means that you're Q-pilled or spreading anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. Guys, let me be the one to inform you that Jeffrey Epstein was a real guy, and many of his horrific crimes and connections with rich men in Richmond and other 
places are well documented. This is not unsubstantiated conspiracy drivel from a rapidly anti-Semitic eight coon QAnon Baker thread. This is a story from what we could call the news. Please don't accidentally admit you're less informed than Ben Shapiro's new favorite country musician. Nobody needs you to do that. Now, don't worry. This video isn't going to be Richmond North of Richmond is good, actually, and here's why. The music is right up my alley. I love his voice. Most of the song I do think is great, but unfortunately, I can now officially announce I won't be adding it to my 2023 country music playlist because there's a couple of lines that it do actually ruin it for me. Lord, we got folks in the street and got nothing to eat. But, but the obese are milking welfare. You're five foot three, <laughs> you're 300 pounds. Taxes ought not to pay for your bag of fudge rounds. So the conception of welfare that he puts forward in these lines is, if I'm reading it right, that welfare is a wasteful and unimportant government system that is taken advantage of by fat people who abuse the system and spend taxpayer money on bags and bags of fudge rounds. Meanwhile, homeless people are starving to death. So this is false, but I completely understand why so many people might think it's true. I've heard the same basic idea thousands of times from Republican and Democrat politicians, conservative and liberal news channels, and also just people I know in my life. Usually, it's not in rhyming form, but other than that, the idea that people believe this old myth shouldn't be surprising. Now, I don't just want to, well, actually, the lyrics of some song, you know, point out what was factually incorrect in some lyrics that includes a series of words like bags of fudge rounds. It's easy and honestly pretty hack to poke holes in song lyrics because, yeah, the song's at a disadvantage to you rhetorically. It can't argue back and it has to rhyme. OK, I roll my eyes every time I see a comedian doing a bit that roasts song lyrics, acting like they're tearing apart a seriously made argument. You remember the song, uh, Spider-Man, Spider-Man does whatever a spider can. Well, let me stop you right there. Spider-Man does whatever a spider can. Spider-Man could do maximum two or three things a spider can do. Uh, has the person who wrote this even heard of Spider-Man before? Okay, how did the rest of that verse originally go? How many legs? Probably eight. He's cannibalized by his mate. Look out. The guy who wrote that song is dumber than me, for sure. I'm smart. I'm smarter than the Spider-Man songwriter. Whatever a spider can. Oh, oh how Spider-Man, how are you going to defeat the Green Goblin? Well, my plan is to wait until he falls asleep and then crawl into his nose and lay hundreds of eggs. Whatever a spider can. Come on, what's that how it goes? Ooh, I'm the guy that wrote the Spider-Man theme song. Like, I'm not like that. That's not me. That's that guy that I'm making fun of. If I wrote that song, it would only be accurate stuff that's real about Spider-Man. Yes, I have an eight-minute bit on the Spider-Man song, and uh, am I proud of that? No. Richmond North of Richmond happens to be tangentially related to a couple of topics that I think most people are very misinformed about. So I think I'm going to use this viral clip as a thinly veiled excuse to talk about them. It seems like certain people want to just ride the attention of this song to maybe make them their own selves relevant, and that's aggravating as hell. Uh, fair enough. That is exactly what I'm doing here. Um... But if you'd like to help me ride the attention of a more talented person to make myself more relevant, uh, you can always sign up for my Patreon. Link below. I will spend all the money on fudge rounds. That is my solemn pledge. I never even had a fudge round. Are they good? I guess they must be. I mean, sounds good. It's round. So first, let's get into why this conception of welfare is a myth and why believing that myth is exactly what the Richmond North of Richmond want. A brief history of welfare in America would begin in the 30s when a program called Aid to Families with Dependent Children, or AFDC, was started. Now, this program gave women with children money to support them. $6 per month for the first child and $4 for each additional child, which would be about 133.88 and 89.25 today. Now, in my opinion, the idea of a program like this makes a ton of sense. Raising children is a lot of work, but without a government welfare program, it's completely unpaid. Being a stay-at-home parent of any gender is literally working all day for bullshit pay. And by bull, I mean baby. This whole time, these elites have been pitting us against one another so we don't see who's really in control. Infants. Oh, everybody's in the pocket of big baby. It's one of those pockets that's on a diaper. It makes total sense to me that a nation's government might want to help and encourage people to start their families by providing a salary to the unpaid people who raise them. Now, at the time, 
people tended to agree with that idea. Welfare was almost completely uncontroversial until the 60s. And this was during the Second Great Migration in the United States. So around 2 million Black people moved from the South to the North in the 20 years after World War II. When Black families moved North, they started applying for welfare. So Black women were largely denied by policies like suitable home clauses and employable mother laws. Apparently, black mothers were both worse housekeepers than white ones and more able to find work to support their children. Whoa, what are the odds of that, eh? Now that's either an extremely strange and unlikely hand to be dealt, or the result of systemic discrimination perpetrated by a system that was built on the oppression of black people. Oh, too bad there's no way to tell for sure. For the women of any race who actually did successfully get welfare, it was helpful, but it also contained some genuinely fucked up punitive aspects. Many states required welfare applicants to be subjected to home inspections, something that, while it may have been well-intentioned through some twisted logic, is also unbelievably invasive and degrading. Oh, it says here that many women on welfare would also have their children forcibly sterilized by the state without their knowledge or consent. So actually probably not well-intentioned after all. A eugenics program against the poor sounds like something that's got to be ancient history, right? That stuff went out of fashion after World War II, when the Nazis made it gauche. Sterilizing the poor? <laughs> that's so 1930 late. But no, this aspect of the welfare program stayed in place until the 1980s. There were people whose job it was to sterilize kids who had seen the Muppet movie. By the time this program was over, they had sterilized 65,000 girls from poor families, 85% of whom were under nine years old. Jesus Christ. So a lot of women around this time, especially black women, were unsatisfied with the way welfare worked, what with all the forced sterilizations and such. So they organized. The National Welfare Rights Organization, or NWRO, was a group that argued that raising children was work. So the chair of this woman's organization was a man named Johnny Tillman, who said, Welfare is like a traffic accident. It can happen to anybody, but especially it happens to women. Okay, listen, it was the 60s. Even the most feminist men were cracking lady driver jokes. I'm a feminist, you know. I really think these broads have a point. Now, a welfare check is like a period. It comes to women once a month, it's gross, and I don't much like talking about it. Hey gang, so I've just uh, been sitting down to draw all the pictures here and I realized I made a pretty crucial error. I make a lot of mistakes in these videos and normally I'm just like, ah, whatever, it, who cares? It, no one's taking this seriously. But this one I felt like, nah, I really should, go. I, I should make an effort to correct this. But I don't want to take it out completely because I like the joke that I made in it. So Johnny Tillman, I assume this is like some, some uh, male ally kind of guy making this joke, but Johnny Tillman was not a shitty male ally. Uh, Johnny Tillman was actually a black woman um, who actually seems really cool. She started this sort of form of organizing, which has later been called the Johnny Tillman model and adopted by the National Union of the Homeless. Uh, huge. She was a huge inspiration to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and the uh, civil rights movement as a whole. Um, she was kind of a ahead of her time uh, during this sort of, I guess this would be second wave feminism, where most feminists were kind of middle class, young white women who were fighting for the right to join the workforce. The Women for Welfare movement was sort of different from the women's liberation movement in that they were more concerned with poor and working class people. So it was more of a, uh, I suppose you could call it an intersectional view. Um, so she would try to bring class into it. And she did a lot of work to try and make welfare a woman's issue. <laughs> Listen, I thought I was making fun of shitty male allies. Turns out I was the shitty male ally. It's a tough moment for me. I just want to read some of her quotes. So she's, she seems like a very cool person. And I think she's been like super influential, but also kind of uh, forgotten, you know, um, and uh, it's an important person. She has a landmark essay from 1972 called Welfare is a Woman's Issue. So obviously the audience for this was, uh, it was this was in Ms. Magazine, MS period. And it seems like the audience was probably a lot of these, you know, middle upper class feminists and trying to get them on board with class issues and how, you know, they, uh, they intersect. So definitely ahead of her time. And uh, in some ways ahead of today's time as well. So opens up with a little bit of a banger. I'm a woman, I'm a black woman, I'm a poor woman, I'm a fat woman, I'm a middle-aged woman, and I'm on welfare. In this country, if you're any one of those things, you count less as a human being. If you're all those things, you don't count at all, except as a statistic. 
I'm 45 years old. I've raised six children. There are millions of statistics like me, some on welfare, some not, and some really poor who don't even know they're entitled to welfare. Not all of them are black, not at all. In fact, the majority, about two-thirds, of all the poor families in this country are white. Uh, and then here comes the quote, welfare's like a traffic accident. It can happen to anybody, but especially it happens to women. So, you know, like, she's joking around, just making a joke. Would she be okay with me keeping in the joke about the period? I don't know, but I hope so. And I, uh, I don't know. I, I don't mean her any, any disrespect at all. She seems very cool. All right. That's all, that's all I got. Um, little mistake. I'm wearing the same shirt, but this is like a week after I fil filmed the, the first part. You gotta believe me. I only have one shirt. I think it's very telling to note how the national impression of what poverty looked like changed during this decade. So in 1963, 27% of photos in magazine and news stories about poor people were of black people. By 1967, it was up to 72%. So the women and their well-meaning male allies of the NWRO did not succeed in their goal. They were shot down by, in my opinion, one of the most harmful rich men to ever reside north of Richmond, Ronald Reagan. Now, our boy Ronald had a goal, to cut welfare by villainizing the poor. In multiple speeches, Reagan told an anecdote to an audience he noted was composed of hard-working people. In Chicago, they found a woman who holds the record. She used 80 names, 30 addresses, 15 telephone numbers to collect food stamps, social security, veterans benefits for four non-existent deceased veterans' husbands, as well as welfare. Her tax-free cash income alone has been running $150,000 a year. Okay, uh, I got ADHD, so forgive me, but I gotta do a bit of a tangent here. So the person Reagan brought up was a real woman named Linda Taylor. Linda Taylor tangent. So Linda Taylor was a truly fascinating person who will almost certainly be the subject of a Netflix docuseries any day now. She was born into poverty in 1926 with a white mother and a black father. At the time, interracial relationships were illegal. So from the very beginning of her life, Linda became accustomed to lying about her identity. She was expelled from an all-white school when she was six and never made it past grade two. Linda had four children in her lifetime, the first when she was only 14. At 17, living in a black neighborhood in Oakland, she was arrested for disorderly conduct and being a promiscuous woman, the first and coolest legal charge against her. For a variety of reasons, racism, her lack of education, her children, and her criminal record, Linda had a hard time finding employment. So, she started trying a little trick called lying to the government for fun and profit, where she would describe fictional hardships and name non-existent children to welfare offices, taking on multiple identities to run this scheme repeatedly, running similar scams with life insurance claims. Linda was definitely a skilled liar, and she was often initially successful in these attempts. But she wasn't so great at thinking long-term, and using the same fake names led authorities back to her repeatedly. Several of her lawyers would make the claim that she was incapable of knowing whether or not she was telling the truth, and multiple psychiatrists diagnosed her as psychotic. So welfare fraud happened to be the crime that made Linda Taylor famous, but next to the rest of her rap sheet, it's not even that impressive. She's got multiple kidnapping charges, a few possible murders, which were never officially proven, but I'd say are at least intriguing. In one case, a husband of hers was shot by her friend immediately after taking out two life insurance plans that solely benefited Linda. Could be a massive coincidence, like I said. Amazing candidate for a true crime series. Every new thing I learn about her, I instinctively want to tell Netflix, yes, I am still watching. So Reagan repeatedly made the claim that Linda Taylor was a welfare queen who made $150 thousand dollars a year by scamming the government. A massive amount of money at a time. And honestly, that, that's a nice chunk of change today. For Reagan, Linda Taylor was the platonic ideal of the welfare queen. Even he would admit that she had to be the absolute worst example of this type of thing. But the implication was that there were many more welfare queens, welfare princesses, and welfare viscounts scamming the system in the same way, but for less money. And if the record is $150,000 a year, there's a ton of room underneath that for those greedy poor people to really make a dent in the national whatever it's called in the national bank account national bank account should I say? but strangely this number appears to have been pulled out of thin air 
Reagan and his team never clarified where this number was taken from, even when asked directly by journalists. And when Linda was indicted by a grand jury, they found that she'd received a total of only $8,865.67 from all these scams over her entire time running them. Of course, the trial to convict her cost the government $50,000, not to mention the cost of imprisoning her. Sorry, I forgot. We're, we're not actually talking about real government waste right now. We're just getting mad at poor people. No, oh, why are you so poor? Quit it. Oh, I wish they'd stop, but not in a way that affects me at all. Back to the other stuff. Anyways, you can probably tell from how pervasive this myth about people on welfare still is. Five decades later, Reagan's welfare queen rhetoric was extremely effective. 80, 90, 10, oh, that's five decades, damn. Yo, jumping in here with another, another uh, Johnny Tillman quote. Um, Johnny Tillman's talking about Reagan here. Uh, this is, you know, during the 70s before he, he didn't become president until the, the 80s, but he ran for president in the 70s. And at this time he was a governor. Welfare is like a super sexist marriage. You trade an A-man for the man. Ooh, good line. But you can't divorce him if he treats you bad. He can divorce you, of course. He can cut you off anytime he wants. But in that case, he keeps the kids, not you. The man runs everything. In an ordinary marriage, sex is supposed to be for your husband. On AFDC, you're not supposed to have sex at all. You give up control of your own body. It's a condition of aid. You may even have to agree to get your tubes tied so you can never have more children just to avoid being cut off welfare. The man, the welfare system, controls your money. He tells you what to buy, what not to buy, where to buy, and how much things cost. If things, rent for instance, really cost more than he says they do, it's just too bad for you. He's always right. That's why Governor Ronald Reagan can get away with slandering welfare recipients, calling them lazy parasites, pigs at the trough and such. We've been trained to believe that the only reason people are on welfare is because there's something wrong with their character. If people have motivation, if people only want to work, they can. And they'll be able to support themselves and their kids in decency. In reality, of course, welfare, even at its peak in America, was insufficient. And contrary to popular belief, the majority of people on welfare have always been white. Welfare was gutted in the 70s, though the sterilizations continued until the next decade. Eh, why throw out the newly infertile baby with the bathwater, huh? I want to stress, it wasn't just Republicans spreading this myth. In 1988, future rich man north of Richmond, Joe Biden, wrote this during his first presidential campaign. We are all too familiar with the stories of welfare mothers driving luxury cars and leading lifestyles that mirror the rich and famous. These stories underlie a broad social concern that the welfare system has broken down, that it only parcels out welfare checks and does nothing to help the poor find productive jobs. Now, the way he references supposed welfare mothers leading lifestyles that mirror the rich and famous is so slimy. One of the most disgusting Biden moments, and there's a lot, crime bill, uh, and how he clearly has that gross old man smell. But you can see what he's doing here, right? It's so clear. He's taking the very righteous anger working people have toward the wealthy people grinding us under their boot and blatantly redirecting it toward some of the poorest, most vulnerable people in America and their children. I mean this in the most leftist way possible. Let's go, Brandon. And notice the way he says welfare checks do nothing to help the poor find productive jobs, as if to say that raising a child is not productive. And I don't really know how you could argue that. And that's actually a little bit of foreshadowing to the next part of our story. So let's jump ahead. The first Democrat to be Ronald Reagan's identical clone, but not the last, Bill Clinton. In the 90s, Bill Clinton campaigned promising to end welfare as we know it. And during his 1993 State of the Union speech, he said, We have to end welfare as a way of life and make it a path to independence and dignity. And uh, you might be surprised to hear that a couple of years later, he did exactly that. Welfare was completely ended in 1996 when he signed the Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Reconciliation Act, which fully abolished the AFDC, the program that had been the only thing people in America meant when they said the word welfare. The AFDC had been drastically cut since the 70s and it was never really enough to begin with, but now it was gone entirely. It was replaced with a little program called Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, or TANF. 
So what does TANF do? Basically nothing. Nobody can qualify for it more than two years in a row and never more than five years over their entire life, contrary to the idea that welfare should be a way to compensate stay-at-home parents for their undervalued labor raising children. TANF requires a parent to have a job, be in training to receive a job, or actively looking for a job in order to qualify. From 1996 to 2018, the number of single mothers without income or cash benefits went up by 20%. Yeah, turns out welfare was actually helping some people. Also, only 25% of TANF even goes to payments to poor people. The rest goes to corporations like Walmart for hiring poor people. Now, the amount families get from TANF has been locked in place since 1996, and due to the ain't shitification of your dollar, also known as inflation, that amount has lost nearly half its value. Half its value? Damn it. That's crazy. Is that right? $1.1996 is worth $1.95 today. Damn! Okay. So the rich men north of Richmond and the rich men in general won. They killed welfare. Welfare is dead. But for some reason, people haven't stopped talking about how it needs to be cut. Echoing Joe Biden, Paul Ryan said in 2018, we think it's important to get people from welfare to work. We have a welfare system that's basically trapping people in poverty and effectively paying people not to work. And we gotta work on that. What the H, you might be thinking. What in the GDH? Why the H are politicians still talking about cutting welfare when welfare doesn't exist anymore? We sent it to H. Well, welfare is one of those words that's a little bit like socialism or woke or critical race theory. It used to mean something, but now it's just a stand-in for whatever people don't like. Conservatives have always been great at finding words that people have a negative reaction to and just applying them everywhere, even when it doesn't make sense. No son of mine's gonna be a vegetarian. That's postmodern cultural Marxism. Yeah, welfare is like that. It tests well as something people vaguely agree should be cut, but it is just an umbrella term at this point that politicians use for any part of the social safety system they want to cut. Medicare, Medicaid, food stamps, social security, disability, and the frankly pathetic TANF program that pretends to replace it. But you don't have to take my word for it. Watching the debate, you can see in real time how conservative politicians were able to use Oliver Anthony's lines about welfare as a jumping off point for cutting literally any and all government spending. Uh, the song also goes after welfare programs. You have been a senator, though, for 10 years. So what have you done to rein in the increasing size of government? Well, thank you for the question. Over the last several years, I've had an opportunity to vote against spending package after spending package after spending package. When you see 16% inflation, we can stop that by turning the spigot off in Washington, sending the money back to the states and allowing the decisions to be made at their own houses. If you don't send it to Washington, we can't spend it. That's good news for the American people. Okay, but just to, to follow up, you did, during the Trump administration, you approved uh, 4.4 trillion, 4.1 trillion, 1.7 trillion over the course of that administration. That's a lot of money. There's no doubt that during the Trump administration, when we were dealing with the COVID virus, we spent more money. Hmm. You say you want to cut welfare, and yet your office spent a lot of money during a global pandemic that killed millions. Did you ever stop to think that maybe a lot of those poor people would have gladly asphyxiated in an isolated hospital room if it meant that taxes went down for the rest of us? These people are scary. How does your mind work like that? I'm scared of you. Another thing. I have no idea if Oliver Anthony is racist, but he had an interview the other day where he said... I mean, we are the melting pot of the world, and that, that's what makes us strong is our diversity, and we need to learn to harness that and appreciate it and not use it as a political tool to, to keep everyone separate from each other, you know? And yes, I agree. He's also 100% spot on about the way racism is used by elites. As long as the concept of race has existed, which is not that long, actually, uh, it's been used as a tool to separate the working class against their own interests. Getting poor white people to hate poor black people only helps rich people. I gotta point out that while I can't know if Oliver intended this, when you talk about people milking welfare, a lot of your audience is going to be picturing a black person. Welfare and welfare queens has always been a sneaky way to say black people without saying it, even though, as I've mentioned, black people were never a majority of welfare recipients, that is still the image many people have. Reagan never had to actually say that Linda Taylor was black. 
He called her a woman from Chicago, and the image of her in a fur coat, plus the changing understanding of the racial demographics of the poor, did all the work for him. Again, don't take my word for it. People definitely took the welfare lines in a racist way. You can see this in the way that so many of Oliver Anthony's fans felt completely betrayed by that very basic anti-racist comment. Wow, Oliver Anthony doesn't openly hate black people. Ah, he's gone woke. Now let's return to that question they asked DeSantis at the debate. Why is this song striking a nerve with so many people in the United States and beyond? No one on stage that night gave a good answer, but I think I can do better. Richmond North of Richmond is striking a nerve right now for the same reason that when I was in high school, I listened to so many songs about being a virgin loser. It's relatable. Life sucks, and it feels incredibly frustrating to work long hours. It seems very clear that the whole damn system is rigged, and those jokers in the White House are just joking. And when I listen to the song, at least the first half, I do feel like it's giving a voice to that feeling. Music can make us feel less alone give our innermost unexpressed thoughts and feelings a voice, and help us with that feeling of alienation that is so common these days. So what's the left's answer to rich men north of Richmond? A Twitter user actually posted this question and was almost universally ridiculed by online leftists, who I know mean well, but unfortunately, and I say this with love, they can't help that they're very annoying all the time. But I actually think this is a good question. What is the left's answer to this song's message and to why it has such massive popularity? Well, the left actually does have an answer to rich men north of Richmond. The frustrations and needs of the exploited working class is kind of a big deal for us. We spent a lot of time talking about this. I, I don't just want to talk about why those lines are bad. I also want to offer a solution forward of some kind. Like, what should be involved in an actual working class country anthem? Does such a thing even exist? Yes, there are so many of them. Uh, one answer here can already be found in a huge amount of Appalachian working class anthems that came before. Unions, solidarity, it's essential that poor and working class people understand that we're all on the same team. You are closer to being a fat person on welfare buying chocolate than you are to being a billionaire. Class consciousness doesn't just mean realizing that you're in a class or realizing who's in the class with you. I think most people are aware that they aren't rich and many even understand that they have a very low chance of ever becoming a wealthy corporation owner. But the really important step where you actually, you know, unplug yourself from the matrix and see things as they really are is the awareness that there's far, far more of us than there are of them. And recognizing that if we work together, we actually can do something to improve our collective situation. To do this, we need to have solidarity with the other people who are struggling. We need to form more labor unions, leverage the importance of our minds and bodies to the economy, and sometimes threaten our greedy bosses by stopping work all at the same time. Union membership is way down in the US, but Unions are definitely having a bit of a moment right now anyway, so it's the perfect time for a new song about them. And the confusing thing is I'm pretty sure Oliver Anthony knows all this. I can tell from the type of music he plays that he's heard all the real working class country anthems that actually are about solidarity and unions. A lot of the best ones come from or are about the coal wars of West Virginia, just one state over from him. Actually, I believe that's where he recorded his breakout hit. But whether you want to help the people who work in coal mines, Starbucks, Amazon fulfillment warehouses, Walmarts, or for gig economy jobs like Uber, the best way to actually do that would probably be to write more songs about unions and less songs about people taking advantage of welfare. So let me do a brief summary of the West Virginia mine wars. To be clear, I'm going to run through this pretty quick. I'm not going to talk about everything, but if you really want to sit down and watch a more academic, like in-depth look at this fascinating history, I highly recommend Dr. Maple's YouTube channel where he has a multiple part series where he goes into every aspect of this in detail. So go check him out. Check him out. Dr. Maples. He's a professor or something. I don't know. He's good. Cool. The Appalachian Mountains are some of the oldest mountains on planet Earth, over a billion years old. 
That's why they're kind of worn down. It's like geological scoliosis. But the coal inside is aged like one billion year old fine wine, making it incredibly valuable. Coal burns efficiently and predictably, and during the second American Industrial Revolution, when trains were suddenly a big thing, coal became a hot commodity, especially if you touched it while it was on fire. So our story mostly takes place in the early 20th century. Now, if it's your first day on planet Earth, you might think that having such a valuable resource would make West Virginia itself filthy rich. But that's not how things turned out. West Virginia is a famously impoverished state, the fourth poorest in the country, with around 17% of people living below the poverty line. Compare that with 10% in Virginia, where Oliver Anthony lives. But why is this? Well, it's because none of the people who actually profit off of all that delicious, nutritious coal are the West Virginian miners who do the dangerous and backbreaking labor of taking it out of the ground. The real money has always been made by the already rich folks who own the mining companies from outside the state. To quote Frank Keeney, a local union president during this time, now, I'm a native West Virginian. There are others like me working in the coal mines here. And we don't propose to get out of the way when a lot of capitalists from New York and London come down here and tell us to get off the earth. Now, West Virginia and other coal states have been underdeveloped and overexploited, the kind of thing countries in Europe and North America normally do to countries in the global south, except this time it's in their own backyard. It's the exact same way South American, African, or Middle Eastern countries that are rich with oil or gold or lithium don't see any wealth from all those valuable resources. It's not about the country or state where the precious thing is. It's not even about who actually digs it out of the ground. The profits go to the people who own the extraction companies. I don't think it should be like that. I think the workers should own the uh, means of production. Uh, by the way, if you agree, congratulations. You believe literally the only thing necessary to call yourself a socialist. Welcome to the club. Mining sucks. In the early part of the 20th century, coal mining was set up like this. Though the miners' union had successfully won an eight-hour workday in 1889, there was essentially no government oversight, meaning that the miners were entirely under the control of the mining companies. It was a libertarian's dream. Also, the age of consent hadn't been established yet. Coal mining was dangerous, difficult work. Mines often collapsed, killing sometimes hundreds of miners at once. Working in a coal mine, inhaling coal dust would greatly increase the chances of getting black lung, an incurable disease that affects breathing. Surely such a dangerous and horrible job would at least pay a lot, right? Well, no. Not only did coal companies pay them next to nothing, they also had the creative idea to pay their employees in monopoly money. Cool of them to liven up the debilitating work that pays a pittance by incorporating elements from everyone's most hated board game? Fun, right? Actually, now that I say that out loud, it does not sound fun at all. Sorry. Coal miners were paid in company scrip, essentially fake money that could only be spent buying goods at the company store. Company stores were just one institution that were part of what were called company towns. You know when businesses will say that they're like a family because they have bi-weekly pizza parties? Well, Company towns were a bit like that, except instead of giving you mandatory constipation every fortnight, your boss would also be your landlord, your bank, your priest, and your whole source of food. By controlling the scrip and the store, the coal companies had a godlike control over the economy, which allowed them to do things like give the miners a raise, but coordinate that with raising prices at the company store the exact same amount. Even ignoring that it was fake money, the miners' payday was often insultingly meager, so they would find themselves falling further into debt to the company store. It was truly a rigged system. Honestly, quite similar in a lot of ways to the modern-day inescapable debt vortex of payday loans. The chorus of the song 16 Tons by Merle Travis refers to this system of debt bondage. This one's such a banger. I'm I, I am going to sing this one. Yellow 16 tons. What do you get? Another day older and deeper in debt. St. Peter, don't you call me cause I can't go. I owe my soul to the company store. -da. Horrifyingly, your soul was sometimes the least of the things you could owe to the company store. 
To help pay off their parents' debt, boys as young as 10 years old often worked in the coal mines as well. Sometimes it was to work off the company store debt of their injured or deceased fathers. Sometimes when a family had no remaining fathers or sons capable of working, the miners' wives could apparently acquire what was called Esau scrip, which allowed them to purchase goods from the company store in exchange for being raped by the coal company's mine guards. As you can see, company towns were an excellent way for the coal companies to exert total power over their employees as well as trap them in a literal nightmare for good measure. Now, strategy that good doesn't just get thrown away by capitalists, and we have plenty of examples of modern-day company towns like Canton, Mississippi, where there's only 13,000 residents and 6,500 of them work at the Nissan auto assembly plant. When those workers organized a union vote, Nissan openly predicted that if a union was voted for, uh, they'd have to shut the plant down, putting half the residents of that town out of work. Now, just like Nissan, the coal companies in the early 20th century had a lot of very effective tactics to prevent unions. But a major one was a time-honored anti-solidarity tool called racism. So we often think of West Virginia coal miners as being white, but that was not the case. About 25% were African-American, many former slaves and their children who migrated to West Virginia from the South in search of better work. There are also many European, Italian immigrants. The coal companies intentionally kept these different groups in separate sections of the company town. And this segregation helped bosses to destroy attempts at union organization by pitting their workers against each other. Now, the situation the mine workers had been put in here was, to quote Shakespeare, fucked. They were completely at the mercy of their bosses. The miners wanted the coal companies to treat them better, but if that wasn't possible, they wanted revenge. Unions. The United Mine Workers of America, or UMWA, had some success unionizing mines in many coal states, but the most difficult one by far proved to be West Virginia. Now, a coal strike doesn't really work if the coal company can stay afloat by continuing operations elsewhere. So around 1912, the UMWA fixed its sights on two company towns in West Virginia, Paint Creek and Cabin Creek. Conditions in both towns could fairly be described as hellish. A government official, Charles Elliott, visited the two towns around this time and wrote, God is everywhere, on land and sea, but he has not visited Paint Creek and Cabin Creek recently. Now, when both Paint Creek and Cabin Creek unionized and went on strike, the coal barons were not pleased. They sent about 300 of their thugs from the very coolly named Baldwin Feltz Detective Agency to strike break. An extremely uncool thing to do. Come on, guys. Isn't there like a femme fatale who should be smoking like one of those long cigarettes while they, they lean against your, your office desk? I don't really know what a de detective does. Well, these detectives evicted miners and their families from their homes and then loaded all the miners' personal belongings onto trains and carried them far away and just dumped them in the middle of nowhere. Uh, case closed, I guess. Now, the bosses then brought in scabs, who were workers who would cross the picket line uh, under the protection of armed guard. Now, this ensured that the coal companies didn't lose any money just because they had done a silly thing like make all their employees homeless. Now, does this seem surprisingly harsh? Product of another time, perhaps? Maybe you're getting used to my rhetorical questions at this point, but I don't think so. Uh, recently, a Hollywood studio executive said this about striking writers to Deadline magazine. The end game is to allow things to drag on until union members start losing their apartments and losing their houses, a studio executive told Deadline. Acknowledging the cold as ice approach, several other sources reiterated the statement. One insider called it a cruel but necessary evil. <laughs> God damn, like, now this is why writers are important. Without them, even the evil shit that these bosses say is stale and hack. They're literally like, we're evil, you know? Like, if you saw that line in a Marvel movie, you'd be like, uh, these villains are severely underdeveloped. Interestingly, by evicting the black and white miners in Paint and Cabin Creek, the company enforced segregation broke down. Black and white families now lived together in the tent camps. And as they all got to know each other, they began to realize that just maybe the real enemy wasn't other races, but instead the capitalists who were literally raping them. Unions appear to this day to be one of the best ways to combat racial resentment. The American Journal of Political Science has found that white workers who are part of a union are more likely to support policies and laws that favor black Americans. 
Being a part of a union increases the average pay of both black and white workers, but it helps black workers disproportionately. It seems clear that unions are a much better solution to racism in the workplace than mandatory HR-approved white fragility sessions led by Robin DiAngelo. I wonder why that idea didn't get any promotion in summer 2020. At this point, tensions were high. Mother Jones, easily one of history's most badass little old ladies, was a teacher and dressmaker approaching 90 years old who became famous for her powerful pro-union speeches. In a speech to the Cabin Creek miners around this time, she did not dance around either the potential for violence or the exploited miners' desire for revenge. Arm yourself, return home, and kill every goddamned mine guard on the creeks. Blow up the mines and drive the damn scabs out of the valleys. Yes, Grandma, I will kill the mine guards for you. Okay, Merry Christmas. Good to see you. Well, the UMWA was able to help them adapt to the situation by providing the striking families tents to live in. At the beginning of the strike, in the summer, this was okay. But the strike ended up going on through the winter, and we will never know for sure how many miners and their families starved to death or froze to death in these tent camps. The cold and hunger wasn't the only thing miners had to watch out for. In February of 1913, in the middle of the night, a coal company train carrying a county sheriff, six deputies, and 14 mine guards rolled past the Holy Grove tent camp. Rifles were aimed out of the windows, and a machine gun nest had been mounted on top of the train. They opened fire on the sleeping, striking miners, wounding many, but somehow only killing one. Luckily, it appears these strike-breaking fucks couldn't aim for shit. Stormtrooper syndrome, I don't know. According to legend, a woman named Sarah Blizzard took a crowbar to the train tracks and ripped them up all around the camp, stopping the coal companies from trying another pass, which they had intended to do. Ralph Chaplin was a journalist and Industrial Workers of the World member, also known as Wobbly, uh, who covered the Paint Creek and Cabin Creek strikes. And he was so inspired by the courage and high spirits of the miners and their families here that he wrote the now classic song, Solidarity Forever. It's honestly one of the best, most concise pieces of propaganda like I've ever heard. Every verse is a very clear, understandable summary of you know his beliefs. Um, I want to talk about the second verse of the song, which is sometimes cut out from cover versions. Um, Chaplin divides the people of the world neatly into two classes, the working class and the owners, who he refers to here as, Is there aught we hold in common with the greedy parasite who would lash us into serfdom and would crush us with his might? Is there anything left to us but to organize and fight for the union makes us strong? After all these years, still a fresh track. In May, representatives from the U.S. government forced the strike to end, giving the miners a small raise, but none of the more important things that they actually wanted. I don't know if you guys have heard, but the government kind of sucks. Anytime a rich man north of Richmond intervenes on a strike, you'll notice they always make sure to take the side of the owners, never the workers. Memorably in 2020, the NBA team, the Milwaukee Bucks, started a strike in response to the Milwaukee police shooting of Jacob Blake, and five other NBA teams were ready to join them. LeBron James was prepared to abandon the season when just hours after the strike was called, he got a call from former President Barack Obama. Obama suggested that the NBA start a social justice coalition advocating for police reform and then get back to the court and don't stop the regular season. So that's what they did. Cool. Thanks, Obama. I'm sure that coalition did a lot of good. Somehow they did. It's a social justice coalition for reform. How much good could it possibly have done? An NBA strike, though, with LeBron James? That could have actually been something. Anyway, the Matewan Massacre. The UMWA decided to expand the union into Mingo County. Mingo County and Rumpelteza. Sorry. The UMWA decided to expand the unit into Mingo County, which included 26 coal camps, including a town called Matewan. One guy who lived there was named Sid Hatfield, and he was weird. Uh, he was known as Two Gun Sid for his trademark two guns that he always carried around and liked to shoot things with. Uh, and also, he was called Smiling Sid for the fact that he'd done his own dental work, which he was quite proud of. He was elected sheriff in his mid-twenties, which was surprising 
not because of how much he likes to shoot stuff or his fucked up teeth, that's all pretty standard sheriff stuff, what made Sid an unusual choice was that he was very much pro-union. Uh, not just pro-police union, he was a pro-coal miner union. When miners in May 1 went on strike, the coal company did their usual thing, send Baldwin Feltz detectives to evict the striking miners. After they'd done this, the thugs ran into Sheriff Sid and the mayor of Matewan at the train station. After some confusion where Sid tried to arrest the strike breakers and the strike breakers tried to arrest Sid, which is just a sign of, you know, how much they felt like they were in control of what happened in these company towns, there was a shootout. One of the union busters shot the mayor in the chest. Sid shot one of the guards in the back of the head, and miners with rifles appeared in the train station windows, shooting and killing seven guards, including two direct relatives of the owner of the Baldwin Feltz Detective Agency. This was a big moment in the mine wars. The miners had intentionally ambushed their tormentors and given them a little taste of the violence and death that had been visited on them for so long. Presumably, many of them had lost family members in the mines, so it must have been cathartic to take away two of their enemy's brothers. If all the miners really wanted was to get revenge, this was a moment where they got what they wanted. On the other hand, as far as getting the miners better treatment from their bosses, this was not such a good idea. Sheriff Sid personally paid a heavy price for his actions. He was gunned down by Baldwin Feltz agents in front of his wife just a few months later. The Battle of Blair Mountain. After UMWA demands were rejected yet again, an estimated 13,000 striking miners, including roughly 2,000 black miners, decided to march from Kanawha County to Mingo, where they'd unionize the mines by force. To get there, they'd have to cross a landmark known as Blair Mountain, and this would be where the climax to the mine wars would take place. The Battle of Blair Mountain was almost called off. Mother Jones very uncharacteristically begged the miners to return home and not unionize anyone and not kill any mine guards. Then the U.S. President Warren G. Harding threatened to send federal troops in. After a long meeting, the miners decided to call it off when they received news that coal company funded men had been shooting union sympathizers and their families in a nearby town. So they unretreated. At Blair Mountain, union workers and anti-union thugs took part in the largest battle in the U.S. since the Civil War. Uh, the miners wore red bandanas to differentiate themselves from the mercenaries hired by the coal companies, and it was this stylistic choice that helped popularize the term redneck. Weird, right? Because this is not really the type of thing you think of when you watch an old Jeff Foxworthy routine. If you've ever gotten ready for an encounter with the Baldwin Feltz boys by getting armed to the tooth, you might be a redneck. If you've ever shot a mine guard with an antique Civil War rifle, which you've mounted on a stand made from an antique Revolutionary War rifle, you might be a redneck. If you won't fix your wobbly kitchen table because you consider it a sign of your commitment to the IWW, you might be a redneck. If you don't have a 401k because you're a socialist coal miner from the 1920s, you might be a redneck. I'm sorry, I wrote way too many of those, but Tommy is just Fox one of these very fun for me. So one reason that Blair Mountain is historically significant is because it's one of, I believe, only three times ever that bombs have been dropped from planes in America on American citizens. The other two were Tulsa, Oklahoma on Black Wall Street and the MOVE bombings in Philadelphia by the Pennsylvania State Police. Both of the other bombings were done to terrorize and kill black people because, well, that's just what cops like to do, I guess. When they got planes, they're gonna drop bombs on black people. What do you expect? But this one was a little different in that its target wasn't exclusively black people, but working class people of all skin colors, proving once and for all that America is not a racist country. In 2020, country bluegrass musician Tyler Childers released his song, A Long Violent History, which directly compares this historical battle with the George Floyd protests and the movement for black lives. He asks for how long we should expect those being violently oppressed to be satisfied with mere peaceful protest. 
How many boys could they haul off this mountain, shoot full of holes, cuffed and laying in the streets, till we come into town in a stark raven anger, looking for answers and armed to the teeth? It's a very powerful comparison, in my opinion. Blair Mountain, a time in history when mine workers, both black and white, were demonized and murdered by their fellow Americans, and the repeated police violence experienced by black people in modern day America. Childers further explain the meaning behind the song in a video. We've all witnessed violent acts of police brutality happen around the nation that have gone unaddressed. I would ask my white rural listeners to think on this. What if we were to constantly open up our daily paper and see a headline like, North Carolina man rushing home from work to take his elderly mother to the ER runs stop sign and is pulled over and beaten by police when they see a gun rack in the truck. How would we react to that? What form of upheaval would that create? I venture to say if we were met with this type of daily attack on our own people, we would take action in a way that hasn't been seen since the Battle of Blair Mountain in West Virginia. And if we wouldn't stand for it, why would we expect another group of Americans to stand for it? Why would we stand silent while it happened? Or worse, get in the way of it being rectified? We can stop being so taken aback by Black Lives Matter if we didn't need to be reminded there would be justice for Breonna Taylor, a Kentuckian like me, and countless others. Remember, united we stand, divided we fall. Anyway, the song's sick. Definitely check it out. Back to the bottom. That's what I call the Battle of Blair Mountain. I swear this relates back to Richmond, North of Richmond somehow. So the federal troops that the president had promised arrived a few days into the battle, and both the miners and the Union busters voluntarily called off the fighting. Many of the miners had fought in the U.S. Army themselves during the First World War just a few years back, and they were naively under the impression that the troops were there to help them. Aftermath. Sometimes when you hear libertarians talk about how much they hate the government, it's like, I agree with a lot of what they're saying, it's just I think that they're looking at the problem with one eye closed. You know, they're right, the government sucks, you know, the government is against us, but the reason the government is against us is because it's controlled by the wealthy capitalists. And that is a group of people that libertarians don't seem to have any beef with. Well, the miners at Blair Mountain in this case had the other eye open. They saw their enemy as the greedy coal companies, which was certainly the case, but they didn't seem to fully understand that their government wasn't on their side either. Although news of the battle did help raise awareness of the miners' horrific working conditions, the Battle of Blair Mountain was basically a complete and total victory for the coal industry. Up to 30 coal company soldiers, soldiers, a normal thing that every company should have, up to 30 coal company soldiers were killed, but somewhere between 50 to 100 miners died with hundreds more wounded. After the battle, 985 miners were indicted for various reasons and many of them remained imprisoned for years. For the rest of West Virginia's miners, things returned to normal shitty, coaly normal. Though union membership for some reason plummeted after Blair Mountain for the UMWA, they learned some valuable lessons in the process. Immediately after their failure in West Virginia in 1922, the UMWA actually helped company town miners in Nova Scotia, Canada strike against their oppressive bosses, where they were met with violence from Canadian troops and company police. Eventually, the UMWA's involvement led Nova Scotia to enact protections for all wage earners, which were soon enacted at a federal level. The UMWA learned different tactics. They focused more on getting the law on their side, and with the help of FDR's New Deal, they were able to fully organize in southern West Virginia in 1935. They used their hard-won expertise to help organize the steelworkers, the AFL, and the CIO. Union membership was up, and the percent of income going to the top 1% was going down at a remarkably similar pace. Now, I know graphs. Oh, what is this math? I don't know. This is one of the most interesting graphs, okay? Look, we can see from this graph that the decline in unions starting in the 70s appears to be directly correlated with a rise in the amount of income that goes to the top 1%. You might notice that Ronald Reagan, our boy, has even got his own spot on the graph. Do you think it's a coincidence that the guy who got everyone mad about welfare queens is the same bastard who killed unions in the United States? That's right, our old friend Reagan cocked things up for us again. The neoliberal era has coincided with a stagnation of wages, 
even as productivity has continued to rise with technological progression. We are making more money than ever for our bosses, and we're taking home less. You see why Solidarity Forever calls the two classes the working class and the parasite class? Listen, I can't just keep showing grass. Young men and women are putting themselves six feet in the ground, and all this damn country does is keep kicking them down. You get it. I gotta give Oliver Anthony props for his response to that bizarre moment from the Republican debates. The question was, why is this song striking a nerve in this country right now? Ron DeSantis said something stupid about Hunter Biden and how we need to drill more oil, and then he licked his lips in an unsettling way. What do you think it means? We cannot succeed as a country if you are working hard and you can't afford groceries, a car, or a new home while Hunter Biden can make hundreds of thousands of dollars on lousy paintings. Those rich men north of Richmond have put us in this situation. And finally, we need to lower your gas prices. We're going to open up all energy production. We will be energy dominant. I pledge to you as your president, we will get the job done and I will not let you down. Oh, okay, so you're saying that to really stick it to those clowns in Washington, we should be drilling more oil. Yeah, that'll really show those evil politicians. They hate it when oil gets drilled. They think it should just stay in the ground. But then they moved to Chris Christie, an unstoppable juggernaut of rhetoric and charisma, and asked him for a response. Ooh, old Ron DeSantis was shaking in his boots. You just know. Oh, Chrissy Christ was about to go for the throat with a... Look, I do agree predominantly with what Governor DeSantis just laid out. And I think that if you asked every one of us up here, that we would agree predominantly with what he just laid out. Huh. Okay, well, that is a certain form of class solidarity. It's just the, the evil kind. Everyone on stage seems to be under the impression that Oliver Anthony was on their side the poet laureate of the American Republican Party. But he fired back immediately. It was funny seeing my song in the presidential debate. Because it's like, I wrote that song about those people, you know? So for them to have to sit there and listen to that, uh, that cracks me up. It's a lot bigger than Joe Biden. Um, that song is written about the people on, the, on that stage. And a lot more, too. Not just them, but, but definitely them. <laughs> Great response, Ollie. It's like every Republican candidate went for a high five and he didn't just leave them hanging, he kicked them all in the shins. I just hope he's ready for when every single one of them uses it for a campaign song. I'm just praying he doesn't betray me and perform at a rally for any of those fucks. Oliver comes off to me like a guy who distrusts authority. And bro, me too. I trust authority about as far as I could throw it. As someone once told me it's impossible to throw a concept, but they were an authority. So who knows what's true? Oliver Anthony seems genuinely baffled that so many right-wing people love his music so much. He's said many times now that he doesn't like either the left-wing or the right-wing. I sit pretty dead center down the aisle on politics and, and always have. When a person like yourself gets labeled a right-wing, left-wing fanatic, like right out of the gate, <laughs> both, in, both in like a week and a half. I do hate to see that song being weaponized. Like I see, I see the right trying to characterize me as one of their own, and I see the left trying to discredit me, uh, that shit's got to stop. You know, why do people have to attack? Well, it? I think it's just for whatever reason I've been, there's, I'm the subject matter the last couple of weeks, and I, and, you know, in everyone's defense, I probably haven't, it, I've waited for, for this opportunity, I guess, to really have a real conversation with somebody about whatever it is I am. It seems like, you know, both sides serve the same master, and, and that master is not someone uh, of any good to the people of this country. I feel for the guy because I'm sure it's no fun at all watching people twist your words and intentions to fit their own diabolical agenda. But if anyone is still confused as to how this happened, I think I have an explanation. What we have here is a song that scores 10 out of 10 on every metric on the working class anthem rubric, except it gets a 0 out of 10 for solidarity. Those three little lines about welfare just turn it from something that working class people could all get behind into a Trojan horse for neoliberalism. Maybe a Trojan horse is, is too intense of an example, but it's like when you trick a dog into eating medicine by covering it in peanut butter. But then the medicine is also poison. It's like you're trying to kill a dog. It's dog killing music. Okay, neither of those metaphors really work. But 
We can see from the debate that rich men north of Richmond is so useful to rich men north of Richmond that it almost seems intentional. Starts out sounding like an anthem for the working class, then abruptly shifts into being some kind of anti-chocolate, fat-shaming, rejected Oompa Loompa tune. The problem isn't just that it's factually incorrect, or that it divides the working class, or that it hurts people who are already struggling, although those are all problems. Now, the biggest problem, as I see it, is how useful the song is for the people who are trying their best to ruin the world. You know, it's funny, leftists look past everything they might agree with about the exploited proletariat to focus on the welfare part. And then the right-wing chuds who don't care at all about people working overtime hours for bullshit pay love the song because it shits on fat, poor people. It seems that both sides of the political aisle can agree that those three lines of the song are the only important ones. There's been a lot of discussion about whether Oliver Anthony is real, or if he's an industry plant, he's astroturfed, he's just sort of put in place by some shadowy, you know, rich benefactors. Like, yeah, I know he's been helped out by some producer guy who heard him somewhere and then paid for him to record professionally and then sent that recording off to a bunch of conservative influencers to spread the message around, and got him kind of the ball rolling on his career. But to me, that doesn't sound like an industry plant. That just sounds like what you would hope happens when you get discovered by industry. I think a lot of leftists even sort of are skeptical that the song could even be this popular, have that many millions of views because it's not that good. But... Uh, no, I, I mean, I listen to a lot of country music, and I'm sorry to say, it's very good. It's a good song. But watching Oliver Anthony do interviews, even when they're with people I do not like, I can't help but still like Oliver Anthony. He comes across really genuine to me. Like, he really wants to make the world a better place. Like, he really cares about helping the poor. I mean, Oliver Anthony does seem open to learning things outside of his comfort zone. He was supposed to do uh, a show with the folks from Midwestern Marks, but I guess that got canceled because he got trapped in the flood at Burning Man, which, good excuse. I did notice the flood didn't stop him from doing Jordan Peterson's podcast, but hey, that's all right. That's okay. I am curious to hear him on Midwestern Marks when that comes out. That will be interesting. Maybe it's misguided, but I actually have some hope that he can just learn to maintain that sense of solidarity when he writes music like this. The song doesn't go solidarity for the first two verses. No, no, no. It's solidarity forever. Anyway, if Oliver Anthony or anyone else is looking to improve their working class anthem writing abilities, I'm going to include a link in the description to a YouTube playlist I made of a bunch of working class anthems uh, about the Cold Wars, uh, actually specifically. And it's pretty good. It's a pretty good playlist. I've been listening to it a lot while writing and uh, editing this. So give that a listen, and when you do sit down to write your working class anthem, try to imagine that you're singing it for a bunch of evicted coal miners sitting around a fire at their union-provided tent camp, you know, nursing their bullet wounds, trying to ignore starvation, and ask yourself, is this the type of song that they might react to, you know? Are they going to be like, wait, what's this about fudge rounds? Is this guy Baldwin Feltz? What's going on with you, man? Welfare. Dude, you have misread the vibe here. Five foot three? What does this have to do with solidarity, man? Is this guy with the coal company? Anyway, until next time, let's keep both eyes open and our enemies in our sights. Now, I never worked in a coal mine or anything like that, but uh, I sort of feel like I've got a coal mine on the inside. And this is a song about that. I clock in in the morning and I clock out in the night. I punch out for my lunch break, 30 minutes to grab a bite. Every hour I'm in the system, I get them easily paid. But there's one thing I won't clock out for no matter what you say. Sorry, Mr. Bossman, but I have to tell you this. I won't be clocking out to take a poop or rock a piss. If I need to use the bathroom, well, I'm going to do just that. Equal pay for when I work and when I take a crap. I don't get paid for my commute or pretending that you're funny. When I make haste to make some waste, I'd rather do it for money. It's true, I spent some time in there, bathroom trip number three. If you paid me more, I could afford to eat more healthily. Sorry, Mr. Bossman, you deserve the facts. A large chunk of my paychecks for dropping large chunks out of my ass. I'm gonna check it over, so don't play me like a fool. It's equal pay for sitting over your office chair or my own stool. 
Well, I like sex and I like drugs that bring me much enjoyment. But nothing beats dropping a deuce at my place of employment. My hours are irregular, workload solid, yes it's true. My boss's jokes are corny, it's all just like my number two. Sorry, Mr. Boss Man, I should really let you know. I'll be dropping the kids off at the pool for 15 minutes or so. I won't be punching half of this, which means, in other words, equal pay for pushing paper and for pushing turds.